Yeah. Okay, so we're at the fourth session already of the ISOG Club, which means that we are uh, halfway through our fall semester, uh, our seventh session, so this, this fall semester. And the fourth session is by Antne on a new algorithm for the effective during correspondence, which makes key sign faster, apparently. Um, so Antne, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you uh, for the introduction and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk today. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about during correspondence and its implication on ski sign and uh, specifically I'm going to present a joint work with Luca De Feo, Patrick Longa and Benjamin Vesorowski. So some of you may wonder why Patrick is in the list of uh, authors since we actually published this on ePrint a few months ago and it was only Luca, uh, ben Benjamin and me. But actually uh, a new version is coming up and uh, where thanks to Patrick we, we reach uh, even higher uh, speed for ski sign. Uh, for those of you who read the paper, actually uh, Patrick's contribution are mostly in the implementation. So the theoretical parts did not uh, will not change much with, uh, with uh, the new version. So a small introduction. So the daring correspondence, what, what is it all about? Well, if I look at this super singular two isoGD graph, for instance, in characteristic P for some prime, uh, for some small prime P, I don't remember which one it is, but it's uh, yeah, a small one. Um, well, so I have this graph and this is what isogeny based cryptography is all about. And the Deering correspondence is this very nice result that tells us there is another world, the world of quaternion algebras, uh, where there are objects, orders, and ideals specifically, which are defined very differently from elliptic curves and isogenies. And for those objects, we can design the very same graph. And so the Deering correspondence is about this link between these two same families of graph and how they are connected to another. And the goal uh, for, for isogeny-based cryptography is to understand how we can use this connection to improve our understanding and make some protocols. So for the rest of this talk, I'll give a short introduction to some more precise mathematical results about the daring correspondence. Then I'll talk about the algorithmic aspects of this correspondence in theory and then in practice where we'll have a look at one very important step for us which is the ideal to isogeny translation and then finally i'll explain how this applies to ski sign and how our new algorithm will make ski sign faster so let's start with a few few quaternion algebra definitions so we consider quaternion algebras over q and in that case, we can always define it from two integers a and b as the q vector space of dimension four generated by uh, a basis one i, j, and k, where i squared is equal to a, j squared is equal to b, and k is i times j. And i and j anti commute, which is quite uh, important. So this means that the quaternion algebra is not a commutative um, algebra. Then we have orders, which are Z lattices of rank four inside this quaternion algebra, and that are also rings. And we say that an order is maximal when it is not contained in any other order. And since we have rings, we have ideals. And uh, in this non-commutative case, uh, these ideals have distinct left and right orders which is how we can see ideals as, way, uh, as a way of connecting orders with one another. Um, we have the usual norm on this algebra that goes to Q. And if we restrict to orders, we obtain that the norm is actually integral. And this is why we can defy, uh, define the norm of an ideal as the GCD of the norm of its elements. Then a few elliptic curves and isogeny notation. So I know most of you are familiar with it. So I'm just going to go through quickly through it. Uh, so elliptic curves defined by the usual via Strauss equations, then isogenies are simply rational maps between elliptic curves. Here we are looking at separable isogenies, and in that case, the degree is the size of the kernel. 
a small algorithmic remark, which is important. So we can uh, use the value formulas to compute an isogeny from its kernel. And this operation is actually efficient when the degree is smooth, OK? Because we can factor the big isogeny into smaller ones and treat each of the, these smaller ones with the value formulas. And so this is something very important to remember about uh, yeah, the algorithmic part of uh, isogenic uh, isogenies. We need the degree to be smooth uh, to make it uh, to make the computation efficient. This is very important. Uh, and then finally, an endomorphism is an isogeny from a curve to itself. The set of endomorphisms is a ring. And here, for isogeny-based cryptography, we are interested in super singular curves, which are the curve having a maximal order inside the quaternion algebra as their endomorphism ring. So this leads us to the day ring correspondence. And so this is really like a translation from the world of elliptic curves and isogenies to the world of the quaternion algebra. So if we fix a prime characteristic P, then there is a unit, uh, we can define an integer Q, which is actually not unique, but we, that depends only on P. Uh, such that if we look at the quaternion algebra B minus Q minus P, then we have the following equivalence between, so the set of super singular elliptic curves over FP squared uh, up to isomorphisms and Galois conjugate C, and the set of isomorphism classes of maximal orders inside B minus Q minus P. And this equivalence is actually very effective because we get the isomorphism class of maximal orders by looking at the endomorphism ring of the curve we consider. Uh, and this is really a two-way street because for every isomorphism class of maximal orders, we have uh, an isomorphism class of super singular elliptic curves. Then we have the same thing with isogenies and ideals. And I'll uh, come uh, a little bit later on how we can relate isogenies to ideals. And then the degree uh, of the isogeny is the norm of the corresponding ideal. A small example maybe is going to be a little bit easier to understand. So if I take p equal to 3 mod 4 and q equal to 1, then this curve, e0, y squared is equal to x cubed plus x, is the curve of j invariant 1728. And we can show that it is always super singular in that case. And uh, it's on the morphism ring is generated from two endomorphisms, yota and pi, whose expression are given at the bottom of the slide. And as you can see, these are very simple, very compact expressions. And uh, so my, my order is isomorphic to a quaternion maximal order, whose basis is given here uh, from the elements i, j, and k. And from there, we can see that yota is sent to i, the square root of minus 1, and pi is sent to j, the square root of minus p. Um, so this is really explicit, we, and we have very nice formulas. So this is a very nice example, I think, to understand how the daring correspondence is supposed to work. Uh, unfortunately, this curve E0 is one of the very few curves uh, where we have such a nice representation. And in general, if I take a random super singular curve, uh, even if I can compute its endomorphism ring, uh, I'm not going to have a nice representation for its elements. And we are going to come back on that issue. Remember uh, that there are a few curves, su su such as this curve E0, where we have a nice representation because they are going to be uh, useful uh, a bit later. OK? Uh, now I promised uh, a little more background on the ideals and how they are related to isogenies. So in fact, this can be done using what we call kernel ideal. So if I take uh, an isogeny phi going from E to E prime uh, of degree D, then the kernel ideal I phi uh, of, uh, uh, sorry, it's not I, it's uh, phi. It's, so it is defined as the set of uh, elements in my endomorphism ring of the domain, so the endomorphism ring of E, such that the uh, alpha on the kernel of the isogeny phi is equal to 0. OK? And another way of uh, expressing this is by writing that the ideal is actually equal to uh, phi composed with all the uh, homomorphisms between E prime and E. 
okay? And it's actually quite easy to see that with that definition, obviously, uh, every endomorphism in that ideal is going to send the kernel of phi to zero. Uh, and in fact, we cover all those ideals uh, with that formula. Uh, okay, then we can do the reverse operation of defining the, the isogeny uh, corresponding to some ideal O. So first for that, we need to define the kernel of an ideal, which is simply the intersection of the kernel of all its elements. So here, obviously considered as uh, endomorphisms. So of course, throughout the talk, I'm going to go back and forth between the representation as element as endomorphisms and sometimes as element in the quaternion algebra. But since I have a, a, an isomorphism between the two, uh, well, yeah, sometimes I abuse notation and I'm going to write alpha for an endomorphism and the line after that is going to be an element of my quaternion algebra. So it's it's a, a bit tricky, but I'll try to, to, to make it more explicit in, in these cases. Uh, okay, and from that we have a kernel and then we can define the, uh, the isogeny from this kernel, and this is the isogeny corresponding to the ideal R. So uh, why are we interested in the daring correspondence? Well, the first motivation was to study security. OK, so I have my super singular isogeny problem, so which is maybe basically the problem upon which relies the security of isogeny based cryptography uh, in its most generic version. And then with my new dictionary uh, from the daring correspondence, I can translate the problem into quaternion algebra, a uh, quaternion algebra problem. Okay, so this is this new quaternion isogeny path problem. And obviously the question is, is this new problem hard and uh, whether it can help us to uh, solve the first one? And so the answer to the first question is actually, no, this problem is easy. And it was shown heuristically by Kohel, Lauter, Petit, and Tignol in 2014 with a heuristic polynomial time algorithm, which was uh, then uh, improved uh, theoretically by Bezolovsky uh, in the sense that he, he, he showed a variant that was proven under uh, GRH. But actually, in terms of efficiency, the, the first version of uh, KLPT is the most uh, efficient one. And this is the one that, that we are going to want to use for practical applications. Uh, and then, of course, the question is, well, what are the implications for the security of my isogeny problem? And, uh, well, hopefully, uh, the answer is, there are no real implications. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be here to talk to you about isogeny based cryptography. And the reason why this does not help is because we cannot translate an instance of my isogeny problem as an instance of my quaternion problem, because I cannot go from isogenies to um, the quaternion algebra, because I cannot compute the endomorphism ring of a random curve. So I can do it for some very small, very specific examples, such as the curve of J invariant 1728. But if the curves E1 and E2 are random, then I'm not going to be able to compute the endomorphism ring. And so this is why actually the, 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 the hardness of the isogeny problem relies on the hardness of the endomorphism ring problem, basically. So more concretely, let's see a little bit all the kinds of problems that can arise in the context of the daring correspondence. Uh, so we have our first two problems, the isogeny problem, its quaternion algebra counterparts. And as I said, one is hard, the other is easy. Then we have this endomorphism ring problem and the reverse problem of computing the curve associated to a maximal order. And finally, we have the same for isogenies and ideals. And in fact, we can show you using mainly, and of course, uh, a lot of other ideas. But uh, using a lot the KLPT algorithm, we can show that all the problem that starts from the quaternion side are actually easy. Okay, so we have polynomial time algorithms to solve them. Uh, on the other hand, when we start from the super singular curve and isogeny side, everything is hard. And in fact, we can show that everything is basically equivalent with one another. And the reason for that is that we 
the endomorphism ring problem is hard, so we cannot go from elliptic curves to quaternions, and we cannot apply KLPT and everything. So this is the this is the main idea. Once we can solve the endomorphism ring problem, everything becomes easy. So this is maybe the message that you need to remember from the slide and a part of this talk is really about, yeah, once we go over the quaternions, everything is easy thanks to KLPT, but we cannot, and this is because the endomorphism ring problem is hard. Uh, and yeah, so these reductions I'm talking about were proven first heuristically in this 2018 paper, uh, and then by under GRH by Pesolovsky uh, more recently. Uh, okay, so basically this is the theory that we have about the Deering correspondence and the different problems. But what uh, does it get? Uh, how how do, how efficient are things in practice? Okay, because I'm going to motivate it a little bit later, but we are going to be able to build some cryptography upon that. And for building cryptography, at least for the efficient algorithm part, we want things to be not like theoretically polynomial time. We want those algorithms to be efficient in practice. And so this is our goal. And in particular, we are very interested in the ideal to isogeny translation. Okay, These parts, we need to make it efficient. OK, so uh, here is the problem given in more details. So I have a super singular curve E, a maximal order O, which is uh, isomorphic to the endomorphism ring of E, and then an O ideal I of norm D. And here, both the maximal order and the ideal are given as 16. Uh, oh, here I make a, a small mistake. So either it is 16 coefficients over Z, or uh, four elements over b minus q minus p to make a basis. Sorry, so this is a small typo. Yes, yeah, so yeah, either you, you give the full basis or the coefficients of those bases. Uh, and yeah, and the goal is to compute the isogeny phi i uh, going from e to e i. So and so in theory, uh, this is polynomial time when uh, d is uh, smooth. Of course, when d is not smooth. Computing the isogeny phi i is going to be uh, hard because we don't have the nice value formulas. Okay, so we, we restrict to the case where d is smooth because this is the case where we can actually compute the isogeny. Um, and so in that case, uh, yeah, we want this to be efficient in practice for a big smooth degree d. So here we don't want to be restricted on the size of d. And this is the part that is going to be important, OK? Because, well, there is a first algorithm which was introduced by Galbraith, Petit, and Silva that solves this problem. But uh, basically, it's restricted to some small set of Ds. And there is some obstacles that I'm going to explain a little bit later. First, let, let's see how this algorithm is supposed to work. Well, actually, this algorithm is pretty simple once you know the definition of the isogeny associated to an ideal. Okay, if you remember the definition I gave, it's simply uh, we want to find the kernel of this isogeny. And to find this kernel, I just have to find the, co the common kernel of all the elements uh, of the ideal i when they are embedded inside the endomorphism ring of my curve. Okay. And actually, for that, well, what I can do is simply to evaluate the elements of my ideal on the detorsion. And then doing a few discrete logarithm computations, I'm going to be able to find this common kernel. And from there, I, can, uh, I will be able to compute the isogeny associated to that kernel uh, using the value formulas. OK, so this is the overall idea. And it is polynomial in some nice cases. So we are going to actually use this uh, algorithm uh, in some cases in our uh, later algorithms. But it does not answer our question because this is, there, is, there are some obstacles. And this means that we cannot use generically this uh, algorithm on any, uh, any ideal of norm D. OK, and here are the two obstacles that we have. First, the field of definition of the kernel uh, might be very big. Okay, see if D is big, 
uh, yeah, we, we don't have any bound on the size of the field extension we are going to need to represent the kernel points. And in that case, obviously, we cannot do the computation because we are not going to be able to represent the points. Even writing them down would be very costly. And so doing any operation on them is completely out of, of the question. So this is uh, some issue. And the other issue is something that I mentioned already. We don't have nice formulas to evaluate the elements of the endomorphism ring of E uh, for a generic curve E when uh, we represent its, uh, its elements as, uh, as things that live in this B minus Q minus P quaternion algebra. Okay. And so, uh, well, yeah. So you I have a question in the chat yeah. on this um, topic. So Gustav asked, okay. does isogeneity ideal from Galbraith solve this second problem? Uh, no, no, it does not. Uh, it does not because the, so this, yeah, this is not something that, this, yeah. So what I said here is saying, okay, yeah, step one, evaluate the elements of I. So here I stayed uh, quite vague on, on purpose. Actually, you cannot always do that, okay? So this is the first part where, well, this first step, it's not clear how you do that actually for a random curve. So uh, in the GPS paper, they actually use that on one of the special curve, E0, where you have a nice representation, but not for a generic curve E, okay? So actually, no, it, it does not solve that, uh, that second issue. And yeah, so I, I'm not uh, I'm not seeing the chat. So yeah, it's it's good to interrupt me when there is a question. Okay, uh, so yeah, let's go back to my two obstacles. So well, actually, the first one is quite easy to solve because remember that here we deal with isogenies of smooth degree. Okay, which means that. For the same reason that we can apply efficiently the value formulas by factoring the isogeny, we can do the same here. We can factor the, the isogeny phi i, and we can do the same uh, with the ideal i. And so we can uh, apply the algorithm on the small factor isogenies, which have small degrees. And for those small degrees, uh, well, we can have, uh, we, we are going to have a field of definition, which is uh, small. Okay, this, this is how we solve the first um, obstacle. But this means that we are going to do that algorithm, translation algorithm on uh, several isogenies, and this means several intermediate curves, okay? Because here in my problem, I may be in one of those cases where e, the starting curve is actually one of the nice okay, curves. It might not always be the case, but it might, okay? We don't know. But if I do that, if I, uh, if I cut my isogeny to smaller isogenies, then I'm going to get uh, a lot of curves along the way. And on those intermediate curves, we are not going to have this nice representation. So this means that to apply this first idea, we actually need a way to solve the second obstacle. And this is what uh, the really technical part is all about, knowing how to evaluate the elements of the endomorphism ring of E uh, for a generic curve E when I only know the endomorphism ring of the curve, okay? And so actually, so we, so, uh, we came with uh, two efficient algorithms to do that. So the first one was introduced in the initial ski sign paper. And then, well, this uh, follow-up work is all about making this task more efficient. So I'm going to present both algorithms uh, and to try to uh, yeah, explain how the second one is better and yeah, how we derived the second one from the first one, basically. Uh, okay, so here is our task now. So we have uh, an endomorphism ring, okay? A curve, obviously, an endomorphism ring uh, isomorphic uh, to a maximal order inside my quaternion algebra. And then I have some point E, P, sorry, on my curve E. And my goal is to be able to compute alpha of P for some uh, endomorphisms. Okay. 
And so the solution we came up in the first uh, ski sign paper uh, actually works for uh, any alpha. So in fact, maybe almost any alpha, but no, actually I think it works for any alpha. Uh, but well, yeah, in any case for uh, an overwhelming uh, amount of alphas, so which is going to be completely enough for, for us to perform our algorithm. Okay, and well, our idea is actually that to use what we know. And what we know is that for a the one of those nice curves E0, we know how to evaluate on the morphisms. So the question now is, how can we use that, that knowledge to solve our evaluation problem on a random curve? And the idea is to use this kind of lollipop on the morphisms. OK, uh, if I, um, I, in fact, yeah, I can always dis write my um, on the morphism alpha uh, with uh, this equation here, which implies an isogeny phi going from E0 to E and some on the morphisms alpha 0 of the curve E0. Okay. And here, the only part which might not be always defined is the fact that I divide uh, by uh, the degree of psi. This, in general, is not uh, well defined because we have scalar multiplication, but we don't have scalar inversion on elliptic curves. Uh, but the idea is that in uh, a lot of cases, we can define that because we are going to want to evaluate that formula on a point P. And so if the order of that point is co-prime with the degree of psi, then I can make sense of the inverse of the degree of psi as like the inverse mod the order of p of degree of psi. Okay, so this is how we are going to be able to evaluate alpha using psi, alpha zero and the dual of psi and uh, some inverse scalar multiplication. And the trick here is that uh, we don't have a generic formula to for alpha, but for each p which, which has an order co-prime with degree of psi, then we are going to be able to, to do the inverse uh, multiplication modulo order. Okay. And uh, so this gives uh, the following uh, algorithm. So first, we need to compute this isogeny psi connecting E0 and E. And here, uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to find this isogeny psi first we, we find it over the quaternions as an ideal. And for that, we use the KLPT algorithm. And then we translate uh, this uh, ideal into the isogeny psi. Okay, so here you might wonder why I want to, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. And here you might wonder, but you said to us, okay, so the GPS algorithm was not generic enough, okay? But in fact, because of KLPT, we can actually have some control of the norm on the degree of psi, okay? And so we can choose it uh, in, a good, uh, in a way that will make possible to execute the algorithm from GPS, okay? Which means that in this very specific case, because I have the full control of the degree of psi, which is some integer t, uh, then I can... Um, yeah, then I can apply uh, I can apply the algorithm from GPS and everything is uh, quite efficient in that case. Uh, oh, of course, it also works because the curve E0 is one of those nice special curves. Uh, then we need also that the degree of psi is co-prime to D because here uh, D, uh, the order of the point P, since we want to find the kernel of uh, the isogeny of degree D, uh, the points we consider are going to have order dividing d. And so if we have t co prime to d, then we know that we can do this scalar inversion trick that I mentioned. Okay, so this is why it's important to have uh, this uh, co primality condition here. And once again, uh, well, this condition can be uh, verified thanks to KLPT and the control it gives us, it gave, it gives us on the norm. Uh, okay, and once we have done that, we use our little formula to express alpha from psi and alpha zero. And then since we have alpha zero is an endomorphism of on E zero, we can evaluate it on any points we want. Then we can evaluate the isogeny psi. Uh, 
uh, and this is how we get to compute alpha of p uh, from those two uh, elements, basically. So this is the first algorithm uh, that we obtained. Okay, uh, I'm going to discuss concrete efficiency a little bit later, uh, because to make this efficient, we need some very specific parameters. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to come back uh, later on that. Let's just go to the second method. Okay. So uh, the idea with this one is uh, that we realized that actually we did not need to uh, be able to evaluate the endomorphism ring of the curve. Um, yeah, the full endomorphism ring of the curve E. We actually need one very specific alpha if it is well chosen. And in fact, uh, one of uh, the important properties is, is that the, the norm of this alpha is co prime with D. Uh, then we are good. We can, we can actually uh, compute uh, the kernel ideal. Okay. So we don't need like this heavy machinery to be able to evaluate any uh, endomorphisms. One uh, which will be well chosen is completely enough. Okay. And uh, the idea is that if this alpha is actually is in the Eichler order, uh, given by the endomorphism ring of the curve E0 intersected with the endomorphism ring of the curve E. So an Eichler order is simply a special a type of order uh, that is actually always uh, the, um, the intersection of two maximal orders, OK? Um, and so, yeah, if alpha is uh, in that uh, intersection of all of endomorphism rings, then actually, uh, well, we can embed this alpha either in the endomorphism ring of E0 or in the endomorphism ring of E. Okay. And uh, we can go from one uh, to the other. So these two embeddings into the endomorphism rings of E0 and the endomorphism ring of E. We can use an other isogeny phi connecting E0 and E uh, to compute uh, the version in the endomorphism ring of E from the version in the endomorphism ring of E0. And so the version of in the endomorphism ring of E0, we can compute it because E0 is the, one of those special nice curves. And then we use this isogeny phi to kind of push this knowledge in E0 to uh, E. Okay. And if the norm of alpha is co prime with D, uh, then actually we can use for that phi basically the isogeny we are translating. Okay. Uh, so, and this is why here we look for alpha as an um, element of smooth norm uh, T, which is co prime with D. And so here the situation is slightly reversed compared to the first algorithm I presented that in the previous slide. Because in the previous slide, the isogeny of degree um, connecting E0 and E was of degree T. And then we could uh, apply our idea to evaluate on our endomorphisms on points of order D. And here we are going to use an isogeny of uh, degree uh, D to uh, compute an endomorphism of norm T co prime with D. Okay, so the, the role of D and T have been kind of reversed in this new method. And so with this idea, uh, here is basically the, um, the algorithm we get. Okay, so first we compute this uh, alpha uh, of smooth norm inside our intersection of uh, endomorphism rings. Okay, uh, I'm going to come back in the next slide to explain how we can do that. So this is one of the non-trivial steps, obviously. But once we have this alpha, uh, first given as an element inside my quaternion algebra, then I can embed it inside the endomorphism ring of E0, okay, and compute this as an isogeny from E0 to E0. Uh, and then I can, that's what I was saying, I can compute the same embedding, but for the endomorphism ring of the curve E using another isogeny phi from E0 to E. And then finally, once I have this alpha as an isogeny, uh, we've uh, computed from the value formulas, 
since its degree is smooth, so I can I can do that efficiently. And then I can evaluate this uh, endomorphism alpha on the point P. And from there, I, I will be able to recover the common kernel of the ideal. OK? So uh, yeah, so there is some small technicalities uh, in the, the choice of this endomorphism alpha. Uh, but I'm going to skip that for the talk because it's it's a, a bit complicated to explain. But th there are a few uh, more additional uh, requirements to ensure that this alpha we will be able to give us the, the kernel that we are looking for, basically. We cannot take any of alpha of smooth norm inside my intersection. I have another constraint, but uh, with good probability, this constraint is going to be verified. So the idea is that we are going to try a few alphas until this constraint is verified, and then we are happy. Uh, OK, so this is our second algorithm. And to understand um, why this new algorithm is more efficient than the first one, we need to talk a little bit more about KLPT and norm equations, OK? So um, I recall that the goal of the KLPT algorithm is to find an ideal of smooth norm connecting two maximal orders, OK? And it takes another connecting ideal in input. But of course, the idea is that the norm of this connecting ideal is not going to be smooth. And so we want to use KLPT to find another ideal, which is going to have the same role as a connecting element between the two maximal orders we consider, but with a nice norm, so that we can translate it into an isogeny uh, and compute this isogeny thanks to the value formulas. Uh, OK, so uh, and actually, it's, it's quite easy to see that this is equivalent to solving a norm equation inside my input ideal of i, OK? And so the solution that was given in this uh, 2014 paper by Cohel, Lauter, Petit, and Tignol uh, give a solution whose size is roughly p squared n squared. And here, actually, the p squared, uh, uh, yeah, p squared n squared is actually equal to p divided by n times p uh, multiplied by n cubed. OK, and here, this parameter n is actually basically the norm uh, so I'm, I'm simplifying a bit, OK? But here, this n is basically the norm of the smallest element in uh, i, OK? And in, in general, we can expect that this n is roughly equal to the square root of p, uh, simply because, in fact, this is like the, if I take two super singular curves, the isogeny of smallest degree connecting those two curves is going to be of size uh, roughly square root of p. It's, it's actually quite easy to, uh, to see, uh, at least heuristically, by just a, a counting argument, OK? Since I have roughly uh, n, uh, sorry, uh, p super singular curve in my, in my graph of super singular curve, uh, it's easy to see that I need uh, roughly uh, to go up to square root of p uh, norm, a degree for the isogenies to cover all possible uh, super singular curve, OK? And so since, yeah, so in general, with good probability, we are going to be to have this n roughly equal to square root of p. And this is how we get that the size of the solution to KLPT is going to have a size p cubed. Then uh, if uh, I look, so and for my second algorithm, um, I said to you, OK, we need to solve uh, a norm equation inside an Eichler order to find this nice alpha. And in fact, we can see that Eichler orders are of the form z plus i, where i is an ideal. Or equivalently, this is, this is equal to the intersection of the left and right order of the ideal i here. OK? Um, and well, the next thing is that you see here that I, got, uh, I get a lattice here, z plus i, which is slightly bigger than the one that I had for KLPT, which was simply the ideal i. OK? And so since I have basically a, a bigger lattice, I, I, I will be able to find a, a smaller solution. OK? Uh, and in fact, 
basically I can remove the part uh, P divided by N. Uh, okay, because in, yeah, in fact, uh, KLPT works by finding two elements, one of norm P divided by N and another of norm P times N to the cube. And the one of norm P divided by N basically, um, it's, it's here to ensure that our solution lives in our ideal. Okay, but since here we are in Z plus I, we can basically, we can remove that part. And so we remove the P divided by N parts. And so instead of having P squared N squared, we get a solution of size P times N cubed, which will be roughly equal to P to the five uh, divided by two. Okay, which is uh, smaller than the P to the cubed that we had for KLPT. And so in fact, this is why our second algorithm uh, will be more efficient because with the first algorithm, we had to deal with an isogeny of degree P to the cube. And, uh, and in the second algorithm, we'll be able to uh, use an endomorphism of degree P to the five divided by two, which is smaller. And yeah, this is really the, the where the game, the gain, sorry, comes from. Uh, this norm equation, which is uh, easier to solve in some sense. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, because obviously, uh, so this, so we found, we find a smooth ideal or a smooth endomorphism of that norm. And then of course we want to compute that as an isogeny. Okay, so this means that if we want to do that efficiently, we need the associated uh, torsion to be defined uh, over a small extension. And so, yeah, this is really this uh, combination of having something of smaller norm that will help us find uh, a better torsion, basically. So more concretely, what, what do we need exactly? Okay. So we need two things. First, we need some D prime dividing D torsion. So that, that is the, the part that we are going to use to compute the concrete isogeny that we are translating. And then we need some smooth, uh, power, actually power smooth T torsion defined over SP squared. Uh, here, uh, actually smooth would be good, but it's too hard to find smooth torsion for T. So we, we use power smooth because it's a bit uh, easier to find. Okay, and this part, the, the T torsion, we needed to be able to use this alternate uh, isogenies in the first method or these endomorphisms for the second method for translation. Uh, so for that, we are going to need a prime P with, uh, so T D prime dividing P squared minus one. Okay, this is the condition for the D prime and T torsion to be defined over squared and here beta for, for some beta between one and two okay uh, obviously uh, if beta was bigger than two this would be unsolvable and because beta is bitter is big, bigger than one uh, this makes the this search for a nice p complicated okay because basically uh, we can uh, ensure that p has roughly p smooth torsion Okay, but once we get bigger than P, then things become uh, more complicated. And in fact, this uh, exponent beta, it's uh, not going to be exactly the exponents I gave in the previous slides uh, for KLPT and the norm equation. In fact, we can divide by half the exponents I gave you. Okay, so for KLPT, we go from uh, P to the cubed to P to the three divided by two. And for the norm equation in nuclear orders, we go from P to the five divided by two to P to the four divided by four. Uh, sorry, sorry, P to the five divided by, by, divided by four. Uh, we get this dividing by two uh, thing with uh, some kind of trick, um, which I guess I can explain very quickly. Okay, the idea is quite simple. If I have an isogeny of degree uh, T squared, Okay, uh, sorry, an endomorphism. It's, it's easier to see it with endomorphisms. If I have an endomorphism of degree T squared on the curve E, so uh, I can compute, compute that as an isogeny of degree T squared going from E to E, but I can also factor it as two isogenies of degree T, okay? 
And this is how basically we divide by two the requirements on the exponent. Okay, by rather than seeing it as one isogeny of degree t squared, seeing it as two isogenies of degree t. And for those two isogenies of degree t, we can simply use the t torsion. Uh, yeah, basically, since the endomorphism is a loop, we have two, 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 side, two, two sides of the loop, which is why we can divide by two. Uh, we cannot go further than two because we have only two sides of the loop. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, with that trick, we go below the the the, the two uh, for uh, for the exponent beta, which is why our problem has a solution. Otherwise, we would need to go over bigger extensions, which would really make the scheme a lot less efficient. So this is really one trick which seems quite simple, but which is really important for the actual efficiency. Uh, but still, since beta is going to be bigger than one, uh, finding p is not a simple task. Okay, And the best method we had for that basically is to sieve through families of prime where we uh, are unsure that a portion of the torsion requirement is uh, is there. So we can go basically up to uh, to p, as I said. So if we want to re-randomize to get uh, some to get a big set in which we can see through, we we need to uh, we we cannot be very um, yeah. We we need to 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 leave it a bit of of space in the part of the torsion we require. But yeah, the idea is that, that we pre-select a family of good primes. And then we try until we have the other part of p squared minus one has the required amount of smooth torsion. And so here, the really the smaller t gets, the better we are going to be able to find uh, uh, a good smoothness bound for t. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, also we can we can increase the d prime part. Okay. Because uh, obviously, uh, if uh, like d was smaller than p squared minus one, we can we, we could just try to do the the um, translation as a one shot. But since we are looking at uh, at uh, d, which might be very big, uh, we we cannot just ensure that all the d torsion is going to be defined. And this is why we need to cut the isogeny smaller parts. Okay, but yeah, smaller t means better smoothness bound and possibly bigger d prime, which means uh, less iteration of this whole complicated process I just de described. And actually finding good parameters is very hard and it's, it's really a game about uh, finding a, a bigger d prime and a smoother t, okay? And so we try to do that. So for the two methods, okay, we obtain two primes. So these are not the, we don't know if these are the best possible primes. These are the best that we found, but we did not ex exhaust the search space. So there is possibly a better prime. Uh, so um, yeah. So for the first algorithm, we actually uh, choose to take, so D, in fact, in our application, D is going to be a power of two. Okay, and for D prime, in the first, in the first one, we choose D to the two to the 33. Okay, and then you can see uh, all the smooth factor here are the factors of uh, t. Okay, so it goes up to uh, 6,983, which is why we call the prime p uh, 6,983. And then for the second algorithm, so the torsion requirement on t was uh, a lot smaller. So we could fit more power of 2. Okay, we went up to 2 to the 65. And uh, here are the factors of this new t. And here you see that actually the biggest prime factor that we're going to need to use is uh, 3,923. And as you can see, yeah, there is there are very few factors above 1,000, whereas in the previous prime, uh, there were quite a few of them. And uh, yeah, and so with this new prime, we can apply the new algorithm, and this is how we are going to get the uh, pro the timings for ski sign that I'm going to show um, a little bit uh, later. Okay, I think uh, now it, it's time to talk about why are we motivated by this. And uh, well, uh, the motivation is ski sign. So very briefly, 
uh, let me uh, explain the idea of ski sign. So first, uh, this is a signature scheme, but the, the, the main building block is an identification scheme uh, where uh, the public key is some curve EA and the secret key is the endomorphism of the curve EA. And the idea is that we're going to prove the knowledge of the secret key by using the KLPT algorithm. Uh, yeah, and here the idea is really the one that I uh, described, which is that if I don't know the endomorphism ring, I cannot solve the isogeny problem. Whereas when I know it, I can use KLPT to solve it. So yeah, this is the, 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 the principle of this identification scheme. So here is how it works. So uh, I can look at my secret as an isogeny from E0 to EA. This is just to make it more visual. Um, by equivalence of the isogeny problem and the endomorphism problem, it is equivalent to say that I know uh, an isogeny between, between the special curve E0 and EA, uh, as to say that I know the endomorphism of EA. So the first part is a commitment, which is made by the prover. So this leads to a commitment curve E1 that is sent to the verifier, then the verifier uh, send a challenge, which is here an isogeny, so going from E1 to E2. And now the goal of the prover is to solve the isogeny problem between EA and E2. And this is done through an isogeny sigma, which is the response isogeny. And here, obviously, the hard part is to solve the isogeny problem, to, co to compute this sigma uh, isogeny. And we do that using uh, all our uh, algorithms. So first, we compute the endomorphism ring of the curve uh, E2 using the two isogenies Psi and Phi. Then we apply KLPT to compute uh, an ideal which is going to connect the two endomorphism rings. Uh, and in fact, here for security, uh, we need a specific version of KLPT. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details here because, uh, well, it's already, uh, I'm already maybe, uh, it's like almost six. And uh, this is not the topic of the talk, but I, I just wanted to stress that this is not the same KLPT. It's a variant that we use for security reasons, but it does the, uh, the, the same job as, uh, that is to find an ideal connecting our two endomorphism rings. And then finally, we have the translation part. And here we can apply our uh, algorithms to ideal to isogeny translation. And this part is really the bottleneck of this computation, and this is why uh, it was very important for ski sign uh, to have a practical algorithm uh, to do for that task. Okay. Uh, so then using the fiat Shamir transform, we can derive a signature scheme, which is what is called ski sign. And the very nice feature of ski sign is that it is by far the most compact post-sum signature scheme if we look at public key and signature size combined. So here are some comparisons with Falcon and Dilithium, which uh, were uh, recently uh, standardized uh, by the NIST. So as you can see, we are really um, smaller than those two signatures, which are based on lattices. Uh, of course, this has a cost. We, uh, so we made a C implementation and, uh, of, uh, of all those algorithms. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Uh, Patrick Longa recently have helped us to make things even more efficient. Uh, it, and uh, actually, so the, the contribution of Patrick was to implement, uh, I don't know if you saw, he, he published a paper uh, very quite recently where he introduced uh, new methods for uh, finite field arithmetic. And so, yeah, he implemented, uh, so this is the new part that is not on imprint yet, the part where, yeah, we talk about uh, Patrick's uh, finite field arithmetic improvement. But before that, we already had uh, an implementation uh, of the first method of the second one. And with that, we get something which is quite efficient for verification and uh, reasonably efficient for a uh, signature. So of course, this is like in, in the world of is isogenies, because in the world of uh, lattices, for instance, we are very slow. Uh, I don't have exact times, but I think we're like 1,000 times slower than Falcon or, or Dilithium. Maybe a little bit less than that with the recent improvement by Patrick, but, but still very far from those efficiency. Um, and here are some uh, examples. 
So on, on the first line is given the first method, which was uh, introduced in the uh, original ski sign paper. And so this was also without the new ideal to isogeny uh, translation algorithm. And then on the second line, this is the new paper. Uh, basically, we gain a factor two with the new method, and then another factor uh, like uh, one third uh, with the oh, no, not not one third, but let more like one point five uh, improvement factor um, with with the finite field arithmetic from from Patrick, uh, which is why basically yeah we we divide. Uh, signing time by uh, three, basically. Uh, verification uh, is um, is actually four times as fast. Uh, and so you can remember maybe that the recent times. So we so yeah the, the most recent times. So this the table was given in in clock cycles. But uh, so uh, in terms of concrete timings, it, it gives like 400 milliseconds for signature and verifications in like six milliseconds. So we're getting closer to something which is quite uh, acceptable. Um, yeah, and in terms of security, so it relies on some non-standard security assumption, which is related to this issue I talked about, uh, about security which uh, requires to use a, a variant of the KLPT algorithm. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details, but you can remember that uh, we believe it to be quite safe from the recent attacks against isogenies and SIDH uh, in particular. Um, so yeah, ski sign is still secure and hopefully it's still, uh, it's still, uh, it will continue to, to resist to cryptanalysis. Um, and a quick, uh, quick conclusion. So, thanks to that, isogeny-based cryptography is really not dead, and there is still a lot of exciting work to do on isogenies and on the daring correspondence, uh, norm equations. So, yeah, it's almost six. So I'm just going to go quickly through those improvements. But the norm equations have a very important role. Uh, this is how we get uh, our speed up with this new work. And I think we can go further than that with better norm equation algorithms. It also has a role to play in security. Then we are planning to do a NIST submission. And for that, we need to find the best, best parameters for ski sign. As I said, this is not a, a, an easy task. And there is this topic about security of ski sign, which is also important. Uh, and then finally, uh, actually, the new attacks opens also some nice uh, possibilities. And actually, we are currently working on improving ski sign using the ideas of the new attacks against uh, SID. And I'm, I'm going to stop there. So thank you for listening and uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonov. Oh, wow, exciting. Uh, exciting last point as well. <laughs> Um, and there, there came a question during the talk, which we forgot to uh, to stop you and ask about. Uh, let's see, Mac, Mac grew. I think this was related to slide 13. Uh, asked, does phi need to be Z uh, alpha oriented? Maybe... Uh the domain yeah that. um actually so that's a very good point uh it does um uh, no no sorry no it does not uh no, no it does not there is another there is an isogeny which is alpha oriented but it is hidden basically um yeah in fact uh yeah the, the isogeny which is alpha oriented is the one that appears here, uh, if you look at the definition of my Eichler order, it is equal to Z plus I, and it is the intersection of two maximal order. And the I here, we consider the ideal high here, uh, is corresponding to an isogeny. And this isogeny is actually alpha oriented. But uh, we do not, but this is not the isogeny that corresponds to the isogeny phi used uh, in slide 13, okay? Hmm. 
Yeah, thanks. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bit technical, uh, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe I can also ask uh, a bit a bit less technical <laughs> question, maybe. Uh, so I just wondered if like the the ten to the third slower is that the same for both verification and signing, or is there a difference between like? How verification compares to to these um, Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm not sure. Uh, I think there is like a big factor for both, uh, but I don't have like uh, exact time for uh, Dilithium and Talcon and yeah. So mm -hmm. I I don't know. Uh, maybe verification is a bit better for us, but I'm not completely sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, in any case, I think it's ranging between 10 to the two uh, to 10 to the to the th third uh, for both. Okay, maybe yeah. maybe this verification is slightly uh, faster uh, compared to uh, signature, but uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, sounds good. <laughs> in any case, I mean, I was very impressed with the six milliseconds for verification. That sounds uh, sounds very impressive. Yeah, yeah. So verification is really uh, is really getting there. Um, well, it, it was the easy part. Uh, in any case, <laughs> the hef heavy machinery uh, yeah. is really all about signing. Uh, yeah, maybe this is something that I should have mentioned. But verification basically is simply uh, so. This isogeny sigma here is a two two to the uh, so for the the parameters I gave this is a two to the thousand isogeny and uh, the verification part is just well take this isogeny and verify that it is indeed an isogeny between E A and E two so this is one two to the thousand uh, isogeny computation uh, so it's quite efficient. Uh, yeah, knowing that our field has 256 bits and uh, we have a good portion of two torsion, which is defined already on uh, FP squared. So yeah, that, that's why verification is so fast um, compared to signature where we have all this heavy machinery with a lot of T isogenous computation and, and so on. Yeah. yeah. But the improvements kind of help implicitly for verification as well, right? Because uh, because of this lower bound on torsion, then you can put more of it on the in the. Like... Yeah, yeah. So it helps a bit. Uh, so the the speed up of in verification. Um, yeah, there there are a few things to explain it. Um, yeah, it's like it's a small, uh, it's a bunch of small things together that made it uh, a lot fa faster than the original uh, implementation, which was not like, which is not completely optimized. And actually, the actual implementation, I think, is not fully optimized as well. Maybe for the verification it is, but for the rest, there is still a lot of things that we can improve. Um, so yeah, but you you you're right. There is an indirect impact on the, on the improvement of the verification. Yeah, let's see. There's uh, been uh, yeah, but uh, thanks. Anyway. <laughs> uh, there's uh, there, there's a uh, question in the chat now. Um, so Bruno Starner oh, asks. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. You yeah can... So the question is, how many times do you have to repeat the identification protocol? Uh, and does it depend on something or so on? But actually, the answer is that we need to repeat only once. And this is one of the main advantage of ski sign compared to, uh, well, actually, the ancestor of ski sign is GPS, uh, so the, which was introduced in the, the paper where Galbraith, Petit, and Silva also introduced their first algorithm to translate ideal and isogenies. And in that case, uh, you had to repeat the identification scheme a lot of times. But here, we can only do it once because the challenge space has exponential time, OK? Uh, space, sorry, expon sorry, exponential size, OK? The challenge space is simply uh, the set of isogenies of a given degree. But in fact, we are not restricted in the choice of degree for phi. 
So we can choose it big enough so that we can, um, yeah, so that we can directly um, do, do this identification scheme only once. So this is why uh, ski time is quite very compact. I also had one last question. I'm not sure if, I'm, if my mic is uh, yeah, possible sure. or not, but it, can you, if you would really want to make it very, very fast to verify, you don't care about signature, about signing at all, could you choose a different prime or something to really get this last push? I mean, for root certificates or so, this would be very useful. Um, yes, yeah, so there are some, but not, not by much, okay? Uh, what you can do basically is choose your primes. Uh, where is it? Okay, choose your primes here to get like a lot of uh, two torsion. Okay, if you, you get like a big power of two here, you will, I think, you will be able to improve a little bit the complexity uh, by having more uh, two torsion uh, of the verification. Yeah, you, you'll have faster, but. Uh, but I, I don't. I don't think you'll gain too much. Uh, our choices are already uh, targeting um, the fastest, fastest verification possible. Basically, like, um, like, yeah. In fact, there are also some variants. So, for instance, if you uh, allow your uh, isogeny sigma, the response isogeny, to include some of the t torsion. Okay, so it's not going to be only a power of two but also it includes some, some of the primes of T, then uh, signing can get quite, uh, quite faster uh, at the cost of a slower verification because now the verifier needs also to compute these uh, bigger prime isogenies, which are slower than two isogenies, basically. So the version I'm presenting here is already very heavily uh, balanced towards, towards fast verification. You could push that a little bit further by yeah, putting more two torsion, but it would not change much. Uh, and of course, the cost for uh, signature would be great. But yeah, so it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's see, I don't think we have any more questions, or if people do have any more questions, then they should either ask them now or maybe ask them later on Ask Crypto. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you very much. It was a very uh, clear talk and uh, it was very good to have you. Um, and then uh, the only thing that is left for us to do before we can sign off is to announce that in two weeks, we will have uh, Boris and Boris will present a talk with a very interesting title called Torsion Point Images in SIDH from Savior to Killer. Um, so again, thanks Antena for your talk and uh, we hope to see the rest of you in two weeks. Thank you very much. See ya guys. <laughs>